it is your planet it is my planet it is our planet although admittedly it's mostly mine you said you want to play your and on this here planet if you ever Refer to a defensive end as an edge rusher. He get knocked the fuck out. Planet H O double G Hall coming back at you for another. How can anybody understand? Yes, indeed. I hope everybody's doing well today. I hope you had a wonderful day. I, man, it's starting to get what I like to call Florida as fuck outside. I went outside today to retrieve the trash. Trash comes today. So I went outside to receive the canister and man, started to develop a little perspiration on some of the softer portions of my body. This is starting to get a little hot out there, a little hot and humid. Anyway, uh, like I said, I hope everybody had a wonderful day today. And uh, this discussion has actually been a little bit of a, um, well, something I did want to get into eventually. Uh, the draft, the proximity to the draft has kind of brought it back to relevance, obviously, as we're citing the imbecile on your screen. So... Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who are not privy, um, who do not watch the NFL, uh, first of all, big ups to you. Way to fight the good fight. Um, But they had their draft last Thursday, I believe. And uh, this gentleman on your screen, Max Kellerman, for those of you who don't know who this man is, it's not your fault. It's because he is essentially nobody. He was like a color boxing guy he wasn't even the main boxing guy because teddy atlas was as long as he's living he will be but he was like some young guy who said a lot of just just stuff that provokes people he was a young provocateur he was just saying things that got people's reaction that weren't always necessarily founded in logic weren't necessarily always conventional Like, he was the person that challenged that. Which, there's nothing wrong with that. But when you make that your shtick, when that becomes your gimmick, well, then it's a problem in and of itself. Like, it's a different problem. You're not actually challenging the status quo. You're creating your own version of it. So, uh, through that, eventually he kind of jumped over to football, which was not, like, it was, uh, it it wasn't smooth. Like, you, you could... All of a sudden, he was talking about football and saying just weird shit. And people are like, why is Max Kellerman talking about football? But anyway, now he retains his position as uh, ESPN's resident Jimmy Kimmel. That is a whipping boy of whiteness and a white apologist. Which apparently there's a market for that now. So, hey, uh, you know, get your money however you get it, I guess. Um, But I and I think you'll see a lot more of this. Especially with, you know, wokeism being so rampant in a lot of mainstream media sources and outlets. uh, I think it's very reasonable to believe that eventually you'll have just a regular recurring white apologist role. Who just comes on and just gets shit talked at him and talks shit about his own people and puts white people down. Says we're all terrible sons of bitches and the world's evil and more black. We need more black. Well, that's what he did for the draft. So while he was watching the draft, he was weighing in, and he said that at one point he was looking at the quarterbacks being taken, and all he saw was white, white guy, white guy, white guy, white guy. So this got some attention because of the implications thereof that the NFL draft is systemically racist. Okay, well, um, I don't know why I would think the NFL is immune to this, right? We're all systemically racist, apparently, in this whole hemoglobin of horseshit. Um, and on the hemoglobin didn't apply there, but fuck it. Alliteration takes precedence sometimes, folks. So this man was complaining that not enough black quarterbacks were taken. Before we get into that, 
because there's a bigger discussion there that I think we should have. But before we get into that, let's just, oh, for, 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 for batting practice, let's just tee off on this notion that the NFL is racist in any way, shape, or form. First of all, the NFL doesn't actually control the draft stock of these people. Mel Kuyper does, Todd McShay does, so maybe you want to talk to them. All of these scouts do, maybe you want to talk to them. And I'm not even one to cape for the NFL. Fuck the NFL. But just because you have a beef with somebody, and I think a lot of people have forgotten this, that doesn't mean that you then get to basically pitchfork affect everything related to that person. Like, you don't get to just ignore all of the good. You don't get to ignore truth just because you're angry. So, uh, calling the NFL systemically racist, okay, on its face, that is just... That is absurd. That is beyond absurd. That is just, it's it's sophomoric. It's, you know, put your own adjective in there. But what it also does is it does not take into account reality. Uh, is there any other organization in the world that mass produces more black millionaires than the NFL? I think the answer to that question is a resounding no. Because although there are other leagues, when you total the number one, the amount of teams in the NFL, which I think is more than any other league, and then when you total in the amount of players that are on an average NFL roster, 72, if I'm not mistaken, all those years of Madden. So... And then let's talk about the obvious. What percentage of the NFL's players are black? I would hazard a conservative estimate and say, is 85% fair? Is 80% fair? Fuck it. Then let's go to 70. 70% is that fair? Let's go 70% just to be super fair. But we can, as a matter of fact, why are we doing that? Let's just pull it up really quickly. Uh, while I bring this other point up, I'll bring it up. But, so there's no other organization in this world that mass produces more black millionaires than the NFL. And we're talking about, not necessarily, we're not talking about people who came from quote unquote privilege, right? We're talking about people who lived in basically American poverty. I don't say poverty because, well, you still had Wi-Fi, you still had internet, you still had a house over your head, you still had access to American amenities that people who are in actual poverty don't have. So I will put that qualifier in there. A lot of these people did come from American poverty. Okay. But... But American poverty is not the same as African poverty. It's not the same as uh, New Zealand poverty. It's not the same as Australian poverty. It's not the same as German poverty. It's not the same as poverty anywhere else in the world. Factoring in also all of the provisions we make for people like that. Like welfare. Like food stamps. So, not to uh, belittle their situation, but just trying to put it in its proper context here. Nevertheless, 70% of the NFL is black. That is 70% of the NFL. So we're talking about people who came from nothing and end up receiving generational wealth, life, family tree, altering wealth it's not riches it's wealth now by the time some of them are done yeah it's riches you got a couple bugattis uh, a mansion that's almost paid off and a bunch of shoes but now you got to take a crummy high school coaching job well riches but for some they put it away they make some money they make some investments they build on that wealth and it becomes wealth actual wealth so anyway this organization creates more black millionaires out of poverty than anything else in the world, which is why I think a lot of liberals don't like it. 
Because, well, if we're creating all of these black millionaires, then who are we going to prey on for votes? Telling them that their life is so fucked up. Well, enter dumbasses like LeBron James. Anyway, for all of us thinking people, the NFL is a gold mine. For if there's any, and I heard J- Jason Whitlock say this when he was back on when he was with Speak for Yourself. If there is any organization that black leaders, black people in general, should be towing the line, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but should be towing the line to defend to the death, it is the goddamn NFL. But here we are. Max Kellerman is saying that because enough black quarterback, not enough black quarterbacks are being selected, that uh, the NFL is somehow racist for this. Which let's just say that was the case. Let's just say that there were people who said, okay, no, this position's for the white man. The white man. And when none of you darkies taking snaps under center, you're not going to touch my son's ass. No, but seriously, let's say that that was a real thing. Okay. That's one position. Still not worth, in my opinion, just just stupid, just a stupid self-hating person here still doesn't justify tearing down the organization that still mass produces black millionaires, even if they said you can't play quarterback. Okay. There are 21 other positions I can play. 22 if you can't edge. So, obviously that's not the case. But just to put a fine point on how absurd and ridiculous... Max Kellerman and this argument both are. But he brings up an interesting point. Why are there all of these quarterbacks taken? Why why aren't there any black quarterbacks taking in the top round? But to me, that talks to a, a bigger point that you can't say. Why are most of the black quarterbacks that get drafted pure garbage there you go you wanted to say it you wanted to ask it you maybe you don't maybe you do if you do you're the kind of person that have a beer with because that's honest there's nothing racist about that but what the people who will come after you hear you say is these quarterbacks are bad because they're black no 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 in fact i would posit that you bringing up that these black quarterbacks suck is a better route to be if you were a racist. Why do I say that? Because that comment is at least steeped in honesty. You can point to quarterbacks that are terrible, that panned out, that are black. Now, granted, you can do the same for white ones as well. Yes. And you can do the same for more white ones than black ones. Yes. But... Black quarterbacks are something of a nuance in the game. You don't, you, historically, you never saw it. I mean, and when I say never, the black and white NFL days. I mean, the first one that we all kind of know is Doug Williams. At least I know. And then from there, even growing up in the 90s, there weren't too many. Randall Cunningham, Warren Moon. And then there were some of the, the lower tier ones like Jeff Blake. Uh, and, and look, these guys made the NFL. I'm, when I say lower tier, I mean lower tier when compared to the rest of the NFL. Vince Evans. You had people like that. But why is it that these guys seem to never pan out? Now, a couple things here. One, in my and again, my opinion. There are only two positions that I believe in the NFL where you genuinely need to be an intelligent person in order to be very good at them, in order to succeed at them, in order to play them at a high level for a sustained period of time. And I think for most of us, when we talk sports, that's what we're talking about. about, We're talking about greatness. And when we're talking about greatness, that means you've been at a top level for a sustained period of time, if not the majority of your career. So why do we seem to never find these people in my complexion? 
well. Have you heard some of them speak? Sorry. There are a couple of positions that I believe in football you have to be genuinely intelligent to succeed at. One of them is quarterback. The other is center. Every other position, I don't think you genuinely need to be an intelligent person. Now, you do have to have football smarts. That's that's kind of a given. But I think you need to have, number one, decision-making, uh, crisis analysis, the ability to actively problem-solve, the ability to assess risk reward the ability to assess dynamic situations and make the best decisions the ability to lead men oh now we're leading into my second point and the second point as to why uh, well as as to why you i think you see a lot of these black quarterbacks that don't do well and probably the most burgeoning of the two even though i made it second I have changed my official Ten Commandments for the draft. I've actually added to it for quarterback. See, it used to read, Thou shalt not draft a quarterback from the Pac-12 because they never pan out. And for every people out there saying, you know, Aaron Rodgers. Okay, for every Aaron Rodgers that you can point to me, I can point you a Ryan Leaf. I can point you a Brock Osweiler. I can point you a, uh, who else do we have? Jake Locker. I can point to you a Colin Kaepernick, although that was Mountain West. I can point to you a David Carr. I can point to you a Matt Leinart. I can point to you. And I mean, Carson Palmer is probably the next in line for you to cite after Aaron Rodgers. That should say something. And that's not a knock on Carson Palmer, but let's just be real. So. I'm adding to that. It's not just thou shalt not draft a quarterback from the back 12. Thou shalt not draft a quarterback that was raised by a single mother. And thou shalt not draft a quarterback from the Pac-12. Why single mom? Well, I mean, let's, let's just look at this analytically here. If you did not have, and this goes back to the episode that I did about uh, our latest contestant for America's new favorite game show, the kid that wouldn't get out of the car and the cop said, you're about to get your ass whooped and he got fired for it. New racist. That's the, by the way, that is the official Planet Hog. That is the indicator for new racist. New racist created. One up. <laughs> anyway... So you created a new racist. We talked about in that episode the ability to receive instruction, to humble yourself and receive instruction from a man. Because the first, there's a fear that is taught to you. And again, I'm not talking about trepidation. I'm not talking about being physically afraid of somebody. I'm talking about a humility that is steeped in respect. There's a fear that you are brought up with when you have a positive male influence in your life when I say in your life I mean sustained you live with this person he is active in your upbringing not somebody who sneaks over to house when you're supposed to be asleep so when you don't have that when you don't have that, how can you step into this position? What is the quarterback position? You're a leader of men, but you've never been led by a man. So you don't know what that is. You don't know what to do. This is not a knock on single moms because look, oh, well, it depends on your situation. Some of you need to be knocked. But how can you be a quarterback? How can you lead these men? How can you motivate? And you see it in the NFL. When you see these these quarterbacks who are who never seem to evolve beyond this childlike state where they're always involved in like these zingers with either reporters or teammates or you know they're angry and pouting on the sideline or they're throwing these tantrums. And I'm not talking about look uh, former athlete here. I understand there's a difference between 
being in the heat of battle and throwing a bitch tantrum. There are two different things. So when you see these guys doing this on the sidelines with these antics and always in these fucking beefs with these teammates, and it's like, Jesus Christ, will you grow up? Hmm. Let's look at their upbringing, though. What does that sound like? Because when you when you when you have a man and when you at least me, when Pop said something, yes sir, no sir, and he'd want to hear a whole lot about why you couldn't get it done, get it done. Yes sir. And you do the job, and that's it. You move on. There's no big, you know. It's just okay. Good job. Keep going. Well, look at the quarterback on that team. You are in a father-like role for those men on that field at that time. Yes, the coach is ultimately the one kind of pulling the strings in the field of play. Unless you're a Cowboys fan, then it's Jerry Jones. But the coach isn't out there actually doing it. So you need to be able to be the coach when the coach can't be there. You need to be able to motivate your men past their own issues. You need to be able to approach them the way that they need to be approached to achieve the maximum output out of them possible. How can you do that if you were never raised around that? If you never received those, those are lessons taught to you by your father. Because for all intents and purposes, mom can't teach them. It's not that these women aren't. Cape, it's not that they're not able, they're just, it's just something outside of the realm of their, they don't know how to. I can go to a restaurant, have the best steak of my life. But if I don't know how to cook steak, I cannot re, I cannot recreate that experience just from taste. You cannot do that. I would love to meet someone who can. And maybe if there are those people, there aren't very many who can recreate, go out, have something delicious with no cooking experience whatsoever, and then come home and recreate it strictly from taste. But that's essentially what you're asking these women to do to make good men. All they can really do is impart the things that they like. Hence, cooking from taste. But they are, they were never a male, so they cannot program you with all of the intricacies. That's why when you see these guys, it seems like their development just kind of didn't finish. It's incomplete. But on the other hand, if you are raised by a father, well, you understand these things. You understand discipline. You understand regimentation. You understand... That's that's the world that dads typically deal with you from responsibility, accountability. Others over yourself, there is no more selfless position in the world than a father. Sorry. Yeah, we get it. You have the kids understood. It's said a lot and I'm not diminishing that, but I'm just kind of sick of it kind of being mentioned as if there isn't another part to it. Like somehow these babies mysteriously appear. It's a, it's a joint effort. But even in that men typically don't, Hey, 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 us too. We let you have it. Father's day. What does dad get a card and usually a tie? What does mom get? Usually taken out to dinner on dad's dime. Usually. Flowers, cards, something nice, jewelry. Some pops, it's just, hey, happy Father's Day. My dad was like that for a while. He'd just say happy Father's Day, give me a hug. Try doing that with your mother. She won't talk to you. So, there is no there is no more thankless position in the world than a father, than a male. Because it's your job to make it all happen, and nobody cares how you do it. Unless you're doing something that directly impedes with them, of course. They just care that it gets done. Now, let's talk about... Because, again, this isn't foolproof. This is a... We're doing a little mild case study here. It's just a theory that I have. 
but let's let's pull a few to kind of put some meat on this skeleton. I let's start with the most prominent, probably the best black quarterback of all time. Russell Wilson. That's where the list begins with me. Russell Wilson's buttoned up, gets the job done. Very probably a surefire Hall of Famer at this point in his career. Russell Wilson had a dad. Russell Wilson's dad played football and baseball. Just so happens those are the two sports he played. Have a couple sources up here for you to peruse at your leisure, of course. They'll be down in the description box. But one of which is Russell Wilson. It talks about Russell Wilson's dad. Who's the next most successful black quarterback? Can you think of one? The next one on my list is Donovan McNabb. I'm, I'm a... Look, when I watched the NFL, I was a Cowboys fan. So there's no love lost between me and Eagles. There's no team I enjoyed watching lose more than the Philadelphia Eagles. Just so I could turn into Eagles Radio Network when I was living in South Jersey and listen to all those white people get nice and angry. (sighs) But Donovan McNabb, you know, for all of the hubbub made about his mom in the Chunky Soup commercial, okay, that's branding. And there you go, another point. It's always, thank your mom. Or mom and dad. Notice the sequencing. But Donovan McNabb, and we're here, again, this is also down in the description. It's uh, from Bleacher Report. So, I mean, they do reporting on sports, and it's kind of a bio piece on Donovan McNabb. You can't get two paragraphs in before they're talking about, okay, three, before they're talking about his father. And I quote to you, his father, Sam, was an electrical engineer and motivated Donovan by preaching hard work and honesty. There is a difference in how these people conduct themselves. Yeah, McNabb was into some shit with T.O. Look, I thought McNabb carried himself very well. He tried not to give into it. He always tried to maintain a professional demeanor, and I respect that about him. But let's talk about some not so successful. Well, well, hold on. Now, let's be fair. There are some who do have dads who do not be who do not become successes. RG3 comes to mind. They talk about his parents, how they were military. You know, I'd I'd like to know a little bit more about that before I chalk him up as a full fledged. Okay, he's a case against. Because, I mean, if his dad was army and military, and I'm just thinking of the time frame, so he may have been involved in war. I don't see that in Robert Griffin III. I see Goofy. So I think maybe he takes more after his mom. I don't know. I don't know. This is a, this is just a, uh, a theory. But I would like to see more about that. However, we'll put a pin in it, to be fair. Colin Kaepernick's another one, although there's a pin in this one, too. He wasn't raised by his biological father. Now, granted, I did say strong male positive influence for a sustained period in the child's life in a fatherly role. He did have that. I don't know how strong this influence was, but he he had it. So it's not foolproof. But that's not that's not an argument against it. (laughs) You know, that's it's, it's almost like so you do all this stuff to hit a baseball. Right, you do. You take all these practice swings. You put your gloves on. You know, you, you you loosen up. You got all your techniques down, and you can do all of that. Swing it at the right moment. Make perfect contact. Hit the ball, and it still get caught. Does that mean all that effort you did was in vain? Does that mean you shouldn't do all that stuff you did to prepare? No. It just means it didn't work out this time. But if you keep doing that, you'll be more. You will eventually achieve success. So there is a modicum of the unknown involved, and that's the that's the uh, there's a modicum of, of chance in everything that we do. But let's talk about some unsuccessful ones so far, and let's see if we can pull together a common thread here. The first one that comes to mind for me in recent times is Cam Newton. Cam Newton. Now again, there's an article here from Bleacher Report about his father Cecil. So apparently, his father Cecil. Um, from, from the context of this article, it seems like they were not very close, uh, during his upbringing. 
His father did play sports, did play football for two years, it looks like. But then kind of went into the business of, you know, uh, trying to make money off of his son. There was this thing where he was trying to do a pay for play scheme with one of the uh, ACC schools or something like that. Um, It was back in uh, and this article highlights it where he was basically just trying to use uh, his son to kind of make some money on the side, which, look, if the university can do it, why can't dad? The one that actually created them. It's stupid. It, but it's an arbitrary rule of the university. So, I mean, if you're going to go that route, they have rules. But Cam Newton. Let's go to Teddy Bridgewater. Another person who's, you know, relatively successful, but not not quite sustained. Not quite what you would call consistent. Well, you go pull him up. And I'm reading... First two sentences. Teddy Bridgewater was born to black parents, Teddy Bridgewater Sr. and Rose Murphy. But his mother raised him as a single mother because his father was largely absent from his life. Uh, That's probably a one-off, right? How about Dwayne Haskins? This is an interesting one. So by all accounts, His dad was like his coach. His dad was with him for most of this. So this may be one of those where it just goes awry. How about Byron Lefwich? Everybody remembers Byron Lefwich. He's now the coach of the Minnesota, uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. One of the coaches, I should say. I was a big fan of Byron Lefwich uh, when he was a quarterback in the NFL. I just like big quarterbacks. So I always like Byron Leftwich. Um But here we are. Childhood and early life. Byron Antron Leftwich was born on January 14th, 1980 in Washington, D.C. His father abandoned the family when he was a baby. How about Lamar Jackson? Well, for those of you who followed the draft, you remember... When he was being drafted, who was the biggest red flag around Lamar Jackson? Who was the one telling actual NFL agents what he was worth and what he needed to be paid? Who was the one talking louder than everybody else? His mom. Well, Lamar Jackson lost his father at a young age. I believe he. it looks like it says he was seven or eight. Yeah, eight years old. It's and, and again, these this is I'm saying when I'm saying these, please assume a tone of reverence here, because that's uh, that that is how I want it to come across. I'm not I'm not making light of these people's situations. I'm just saying, hey, there's a common thread here. How about Vince Young? Remember him? Vince Young. Young grew up in Hiram Clark neighborhood of Houston, Texas, where he was primarily raised by his mother and grandmother. How about Dante Culpepper? Another guy who had some success. Not great, though. Dante Culpepper. Well, let me just read it. While his mother was pregnant with him, she was serving time for armed robbery. Culpepper was adopted when he was a day old and raised of raised as one of more than 15 children of the late Emma Lewis Culpepper, probably grandmom. You know, because that's that's what every senior citizen has to look forward to. I barely got through raising you and you're a fuck up. And now you fucked up and dumped that in my lap. Great. So I'm just naming a few black quarterbacks here of some repute, of some reputation. 
Uh, and, and look, there's a common thread here, but we can't get to that because we can't even say these black quarterbacks suck. But if we're allowed to say these black quarterbacks suck, then maybe we can get to the next question, which is why? And I'm telling you, this is a factor. If it weren't a factor, it would not be present in all of these cases, cases that have spanned generations of the NFL, by the way. Let's talk about Warren Moon. He made the NFL Hall of Fame. He's been in some trouble, you know, from time to time, DUIs and whatnot. I think he had a something with a relationship as well. Well, Warren Moon's father died of liver disease when he was seven years old. So there's something to this of not having that that man in your life to teach you how to go out and lead men. But we can't talk about that because it's racist. See, it's almost as if the people who are afraid to have that discussion, and maybe I alluded to this point earlier and I didn't finish it. Apologies. I think the people who refuse to have, the people, the Max Kellermans of the world, the people who avoid this discussion are the ones with something to hide. Why? Because it's hard to keep up the act when we start getting close to real, what's real with you when we hit pay dirt. So instead of getting to an area where you'll expose yourself, let's just kind of put the blame off on something else so we can never actually focus on what the real issue is. Because if you were to say, man, these black quarterbacks suck, why? Well, now we're talking about, let's explore something. Let's find out an answer to a legitimate question. To a legitimate question. But that's not the same thing as saying these quarterbacks suck because they're black. Which I don't believe. I don't believe there's anything inherent in my DNA that would make me a terrible quarterback. I think I'd be a great quarterback. If I could throw. <laughs> but no, all kidding aside. It's like we can't even have this discussion because there's a segment that is deemed any kind of proprietary exploration into this as, as racist. But I think they're the ones who are racist because they're trying to keep it off of this. They don't want the problem to be fixed. And again, problem. I mean, that's a relative term. Oh, you suck at this job where you're still going to get paid millions anyway. Yeah, that's a nice problem. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that's what I have for you for today. Just a little food for thought, man. I mean, I'm looking at these quarterbacks. And please, I defy anyone out there. Poke a hole in this theory. This isn't codified law. This is just a theory that I have. But poke a hole in this. Let's find, find me one quarterback. And that position specifically because you have to lead. You have to be buttoned up. You have to be professional. You have to be able to navigate other men's issues, emotions, shortcomings, and get them to the goal. And in order to do that, again, you have to be able to read and speak communicate effectively to men which most of these people will not would not have had if they were raised by a single mom because at a certain point you become bigger than her physically bigger than her so she can't just threaten you with violence anymore because and in a lot of these cases you end up finding out that the son put hands on the mom which is why he can you know bring all this shit in the house and sell drugs out the house and she's just basically a hostage paying mortgage and rent so at a certain point might makes right with a single mom because she can't physically back up anything she says and that's the unspoken punctuation mark at the end of every statement with your father is that if you don't do this i'm gonna come up in that chest and rearrange some bones you're gonna take a dad punch to the chest to the solar plexus So, and you see that play out on the field. Let's carry that forward. You see that play out on the field when you have these quarterbacks who throw these tantrums. 
And when the coach tries to check them, they don't listen to the coach because I make more money than you. I'm the star of this team. If I go to the owner, if it's going to be you or me, it's going to be you probably, depending upon how old I am. But there's a point in every quarterback's career where they could get a coach fired. Absolutely. But there's a responsibility in that because there come a point in your life where you could probably beat your dad's ass, but you don't do it. Because at that point, you will have learned a humility and a respect that comes with authority and power that hopefully was imparted to you by the man in your life. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that is what I have for you today. Again, put it out there. Please poke a hole in this. Show me one Hall of Famer that was raised by a single mom that played quarterback. That's what I got for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And uh, like I said, if you find that quarterback, shoot him. Put 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 a uh, don't shoot him. Put shoot his name in the <laughs> shoot his name in the comments. Uh, and we'll we'll explore it. But I I think this is a solid working theory from Hulk Laboratories. So, ladies and gentlemen, until the next time, peace.